It's a guitar that's been missing from my collection, a tool missing from my musician's toolbox. I don't quite know why it's taken me so long to fall in love with the telly and its legacy. But maybe that's all about to change, because here is my first, and dare I say, most definitely not my last, Fender Telecaster. But before I speak about this specific model, a little history lesson. Leo Fender never learned to play the guitar. He could never devote the time necessary to really mastering the instrument. He finessed his designs by calling on friends and local musicians to road test them, using a process of trial and error to find out what really mattered to them. From the very beginning, his guitars have had the working musician in mind. Leo Fender had a vision. Inspired by the practicality of solid body Hawaiian guitars, he wanted to create a robust, hardy guitar that could be easily mass produced. Absolutely no acoustic body because he didn't have the necessary skilled luthiers on his team. Nothing hand carved. The neck and body should be able to be made separately and bolted together. No separate fingerboard either. Just frets slid into grooves cut directly into the wood a removable control plate so the electronics could be easily accessed and repaired when necessary. Single coil pickups had proved popular with players. The bright tone, especially welcomed by country players as they competed with the sounds of banjos and fiddles. So let's add one of those in as well. The result? The Esquire was launched at NAMM in the spring of 1950, but didn't exactly set the world on fire. Compared to the more ornate offerings on show, it looked unsophisticated and clunky. Journalists reporting the offerings from that year called it a canoe paddle, a snow shovel, and even a toilet seat with strings. In the face of the bad press, salesmen concluded that the markets just weren't ready for such an instrument. But the feedback from those who mattered, professional touring musicians and session players, gave Leo Fender confidence that he was onto something good. He kept tinkering with the design, adding a truss rod in the neck to avoid bowing and a second pickup after strong feedback from his team who feared they'd be left behind by competitors like Gibson who were offering two or even three pickups. By late 1950, two very similar models were in production, the single pickup Esquire and the two pickup model named the Broadcaster. This name was quickly changed after launch because of a strongly worded letter from Gretsch, whose range of broadcaster with a K drums were already on sale. Not wanting to halt production while they came up with new branding, the headstock transfers had the broadcaster cut off, meaning there's about 500 highly collectible no-casters out there in the world. It was Leo's business partner, Don Randall, who came up with the new name seeking to capitalize on the American public's infectious enthusiasm for the newly available television. And so, the Telecaster was born. The Esquire suffered neck problems and was discontinued in 1969, but the Telecaster quickly gained a reputation as a versatile, reliable working musician's instrument, and sales took off. It's been in production ever since, becoming the world's first mass-produced, commercially successful, solid-body electric guitar. Its many famous players include Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Keith Richards, David Gilmour, Muddy Waters, Joe Strummer, PJ Harvey, Johnny Greenwood, and Jeff Buckley. George Harrison used a Rosewood telly for the Beatles' 1969 rooftop concert, their last ever public performance together. Its most famous songs? So many to choose from. Jimmy Page used his Dragon Telecaster gifted to him by Jeff Beck on the solo for Stairway to Heaven. Rage Against the Machines, Tom Morello, proved Telecasters can go heavy on Killing in the Name of. Otis Redding's guitarist Steve Cropper kept it chill on Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. Jeff Buckley used a borrowed telly on Grace. It's now owned by Matt Bellamy of Muse. Other famous Telecaster songs include T-Rex's 20th Century Boy, Radiohead's Paranoid Android, The Police's Roxanne, Booker T and the MG's Green Onions, Queen's Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and Johnny Cash's Folsom Prism Blues. Eric Clapton gifted a Telecaster to Keith Richards for his 27th birthday when the Rolling Stones were preparing to work on Exile on Main Street. He called it Micawber after the character Wilkins Micawber in Charles Dickens' novel, David Copperfield. Sometime during the Exile sessions, Richards removed the low E string and tuned the five string guitar in an open G chord, massively influencing the future sound of the Rolling Stones. Keith Richards said, 
Around the same time I was getting into Telecasters, I was experimenting with open tunings. I don't know why. Maybe it was because around that time, 67, we started having time off that we didn't know what to do with. So I started to experiment with tunings. Most people used open tuning basically just for slide. Nobody used it for anything else. But I wanted to use it for rhythm guitar. And what I found was, of all the guitars, the Telecaster really lent itself well to a dry rhythm five string drone thing. In a way, that tuning kept me developing as a guitarist. McCorber was soon joined by two other tellies christened Dwight and Malcolm. In his memoir, Life, Richards writes, Most of the people who made them in 54, 55, 56 are dead and gone, but you can still read the names of the checkers, the ones who gave them the seal of approval inside the guitars. So the guitars get their nicknames from their checkers. On Satisfaction, I play a lot of Malcolm, a Telecaster, while on Jumpin' Jack Flash, I play Dwight another Telecaster. Micawber is a real all-rounder. Micawber's got a lot of highs. Malcolm's got more bottom on it, and Dwight's an in-betweener. You might think Prince is another iconic Tele player, but that's not exactly true. His favourite studio guitar is in fact a Hona Madcat, a guitar with a similar body to a Telecaster, but closer to a Strat in terms of pickups and bridge. Only 500 were made before its maker, the Morris Guitar Company, received a cease and desist from Fender over similarities in their headstock design. Prince reportedly bought it because the leopard print pickguard went very well with his stage costume. It became his constant companion, and he recorded the majority of his albums with it. As his star rose, Hona brought it back into production with a different headstock, of course. Perhaps more than any other player, when it comes to Telecasters, you have to pay homage to the boss. Bruce Springsteen's favourite guitar is actually something of a mutt. Heavily modified with a Telecaster body but an Esquire neck, he bought the guitar for $185 from a New Jersey guitar shop owned by Phil Patillo in 1972, just after he signed a deal with Columbia. The story goes that it was previously owned by a record company and had been rigged with four pickups, meaning a lot of wood from the body had been scooped out, making it lighter than a standard Telecaster. His guitar texts have said it's from 1953 or 54. It's such an integral part of me. I've held it aloft to the audience on thousands and thousands and thousands of nights, I suppose with the idea that it says something about the power of rock and roll and the power of us. More recently, they've been rocked by Franz Ferdinand, Courtney Bartnett, Carrie Brownstein from Slater Kinney, Ellie Rousel from Wolf Alice, and Jim Root of Slipknot. And now, me. <laughs> Fender gifted me this Vintera 2 60s Telecaster in Fiesta Red, so let's get into the specs. It has an alder body and maple C-shaped neck with rosewood fingerboard. It has a 7.25 inch radius and vintage style high frets, plus snappy sounding vintage style pickups, slotted steel three saddle bridge and matching tuners. It's a classic, it's instantly recognisable and I'm enjoying every second of playing it. Let me know what you think in the comments below and if you're a telly player, make yourself known. Although this video isn't sponsored, thank you to Fender. It is a dream come true. And as always, I'll be seeing you here very soon. Mm -hmm.